It's really, really great uh, to, to be here. It's, it's an honor and a privilege. Um, and uh, well, it's, I'm just glad to be. It's a little cold, but that's all right. <clears throat> Back in Chattanooga, you know, our weather is pretty nice. <laughs> no, not really. I thought I would call your attention this morning to a passage in Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 36, uh, starting with verse 16. I, uh, I've been doing a lot of thinking and agonizing over the state of the church in America. Uh, my wife and I both are involved in uh, several things, among others, uh, the persecuted church uh, overseas. and. Uh, of course, we've had the persecuted church here in America too, for that matter, but, but we have a concern for that. And I think one of the things that as we go into the next few days, we are seeing an increasing hostility towards uh, the Christian faith. Uh, we are, have been marginalized uh, and now we're losing privileges, uh, but that's okay, you know, that's nothing new. Generally, it's normal for the church to be in a situation like that. But I guess what I'm saying is that all of you, all of us, uh, who, whether we come from the dominant culture or the subdominant culture, we're losing the, the perks that Christianity has enjoyed uh, that's come from the dominant culture. All of us together now are subdominant. And one of the things that subdominant people suffer is they are always represented by the worst of them. I notice if you see on TV, they talk about Christianity, it's always the worst case scenario. So it's just like they all paint, they paint us all with the brush of Westboro Baptist Church. You know what I'm saying, that kind of thing. <clears throat> so that's gonna increasingly happen. And uh, some of us have learned how to navigate those waters. And uh, we can all learn from each other to see how we go in the future. But that's all right, as long as God's name is being glorified. The heck with what, it, what, what that uh, means for us. Is that right? Amen. Ezekiel 36. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, when the people of Israel were living in their own land, they defiled it by their conduct and their actions. <clears throat> so I poured out my wrath on them because they had shed blood in the land and because they had defiled it with their idols. I, I dispersed them among the nations and they were scattered through the countries. I judged them according to their conduct and their actions. And wherever they went among the nations, they profane my holy name. For it was said of them, these are the Lord's people, and yet they had to leave his land. I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel profaned among the nations where they had gone. Therefore say this to the house of Israel, this is what the sovereign Lord says, it is not for your sake O house of Israel, that I'm going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, which you are profaned among the nations where you have gone. I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the sovereign Lord, when I show myself holy through you in their eyes. Okay, on, on the verse 24. For I will take you out of the nations and I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back to your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from your idols. I will give you a new heart and put my spirit in you. I will remove from you the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. You will live in the land I gave to your forefathers and you will be my people and I will be your God. And then he goes on at the end here uh, in verse 32. He reminds them, he says, I want you to know that I am not doing this for your sake, declares the Lord. And of course, by implication, you see, he is saying for the sake of his holy name. I want to call your attention to focus on uh, verse 20 through 21 uh, here. 
And wherever they went among the nations, they profaned my holy name, for it was said of them, these are the Lord's people, and yet they had to leave his land. I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel profaned among the nations where they had gone. And then a familiar one we've, we've heard a lot lately, 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and, for, and will forgive their sin and heal their land. I, in my tradition, I would say, I just stopped by this morning to share with you a few thoughts on the subject. What's in a name? What's in a name? Um, it's been a great privilege to be a father. It's been one of the greatest spiritual experiences of my life because I didn't really understand a father's love for a child until I became one. And then all of a sudden I realized if God loves me half as much as I love this little person that I'm holding in one hand, then I got nothing to worry about. And when a loving parent has to give his child a spanking, he often says, this will hurt me more than it hurts you. I know my son and daughter sometimes, they will say, Daddy, Daddy, don't hurt yourself, please. <laughs> I love you. I say, I love you too. <laughs> but you know, when God disciplines his people, he in essence is saying the same thing. Have you ever thought about that? When God disciplines us, it hurts him more than it hurts us. In this passage, uh, it begs two questions. Number one, how did God's people end up scattered among the nations? And then the second question, why was God so determined to restore his people to the land he had promised them? Okay, let's deal with the first question. How did God's people end up scattered among the nations? Well, through Ezekiel, God told Israel that they had defiled the land in two ways. One, through bloodshed, you know, baby killing on pagan altars. You know, they, they used to burn their newborns to death on these pagan altars. Through injustice, through conspiracies, through oppression, through violence, through greed, etc., etc. But he also said they had profaned, uh, they, they had defiled the land through idolatry. It affected every aspect of their, of their lives. It drew them, it continually drew them away from God. And it dragged them down into perversions of every kind. God even told them that their covenant violations were as serious as the sins of Sodom. And we know Sodom was infamous for its evil. However, the reasons God gives for nuking Sodom might surprise us. Ezekiel 16, 49, it says this. Now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. By the way, he says, your sister Sodom. So in other words, he's saying that you're just like Sodom. But he says, this is something that kind of intrigued me. Sodom and her daughters, what are the daughters of Sodom? Have you ever thought about that? What are the daughters of Sodom? Sodom was an evil, sinful city, but what are the daughters of Sodom? Let me tell you, they were the surrounding suburbs. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> so that there was one ecology of evil going on out there. <clears throat> and thus we can see that the behaviors that made Sodom infamous were symptoms of their root sins. A lot of times we look at their behaviors and we say, oh, they were terrible because of those behaviors. But what were the root causes of that? The Bible tells us that they were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy, and they were haughty. Now, let me digress a bit here. You see, <clears throat> when it comes to covenant faithfulness or unfaithfulness, 
there are two sides to this thing. There, there are at least two sides. There's an A side, which concerns itself with epistemological faithfulness. In other words, what we should know about God. Do we have our doctrine straight? Do we believe the right things about the Bible? And yes, I'm firmly committed to that A side. You don't have to worry about me. I'm not one of those funny guys, you know. <laughs> I believe the Bible from cover to cover. And I, I, I loved it when I learned Hebrew because now I know what a jot and tittle is. <laughs> but we often forget that there is a B side to all of this. And that is not just the epistemological side, you know, in other words, what we should know about God. But there's a B side, the ethical side. That is how we should obey God. Now, in the West, the body of Christ uh, was challenged by unbelieving philosophy and science. And if you know anything about theology as it developed in the West, you know that's what, that's what happened. And thus, the Western church tended to see faithfulness to God in epistemological terms, side A. But, for example, in the African-American context, the body of Christ was persecuted and challenged by oppression. Racism, slavery, Jim Crow, etc. And thus, the African-American church tended to see faithfulness to God in ethical terms, two sides of the same coin. And I think one of the things that helped me to understand why we in the Bible-believing community missed the significance of the Civil Rights Movement, which was, by the way, a very thoroughly theological movement, even though the participants didn't quite understand that because they didn't have the tools to see that. Now, that's side B. Now, both sides A and B are crucially important. So I'm not saying that we should neglect one for the other, but we need both. However, if you look at the scripture as a whole, it is clear that God's concern for ethical faithfulness is prominent. Think of all the judgment scenes in the Bible. What were the issues? Were they ethical or were they epistemological? I cannot think of one that was epistemological, even though I'm, I'm all with this epistemological stuff. But they seem to be ethical things. They were haughty. They were overfed. They were unconcerned. And yet, in the history of the Western Bible-believing church, um, in the dominant culture especially, it is clear that concern for epistemological faithfulness has been prominent. Now, when we in the body of Christ are not fully faithful on both sides, A and B, then we lose our integrity and become unbalanced, non-prophetic, and non-transformative. Perhaps this partly explains the declining influence of the Bible-believing church in America. And I think one of the things that makes me sad is that you see Bible-believing Christians running out here like Israel used to run to Egypt for salvation. Oh, Egypt, will you help us, please? And I see evangelical Christians running to politics to save them. Let me tell you something about politics. It will pimp you. <laughs> I know, and I've seen it on both sides. Some folk run to the conservative, some folk run to the liberal. There's no salvation there. Salvation is only in Christ, he's Lord. And in the case of Israel, God had reportedly war uh, repeatedly warned them that about their unfaithfulness, that if they continued on their self-destructive path, he would discipline them by scattering them among the nations. And being a good father, 
God was very concerned that his people be restored to right relationship with him. Why do we discipline our kids in the first place? Is it to punish them? No. We discipline our kids to restore right relationship. We discipline our kids uh, and we use whatever audiovisual means at our disposal <laughs> to help them remember the lesson of this situation. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. Think about that. You know, God loves us and he disciplines us because he loves us. He's our father. Well, well, God was so concerned about his people that he carried out his threat to scatter them. You know, as a parent, if you tell your child, don't you do this or else this is going to happen, and they do it and this doesn't happen, guess what? That's a bad lesson taught. <laughs> and so he made them learn the hard way how important it was to follow his ways. Now, here's the thing that kind of blew me away as I looked at this passage. God laid his own reputation on the line to discipline his people. Now, in the ancient Near East, a nation was uniquely tied to their land. It was uniquely defined by its land. And if a people was forced to leave that land, it was a demonstration that the God or the gods it worshiped were not strong enough to protect them. It didn't matter if they were forced out by invasion, by famine, by economic sanctions, by disease, by disaster. It didn't matter if the people had to leave the land of that God, then that God was not strong enough to keep them there. And therefore, when God scattered Israel among the nations, these nations concluded that God was weak, that he was a wimp, and that he was a chump. And thus, the name of God was profaned, it was ruined, and it was slandered. Imagine the pressure that the Babylonians put on Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Forsake Yahweh, the wimp. Look, we ripped off his temple. What kind of God is he? You're in Babylon now, the superpower. Worship our gods. Our gods are stronger than the gods, than, the, than, than, than Israel's God. As a matter of fact, of course, God did some things that kind of disproved that, didn't he? And I'll, I'll never forget at that banquet, you remember uh, uh, after, uh, you know, when Nebuchadnezzar made Daniel uh, secretary of theological education throughout all of Babylon, you know. <laughs> what, what Daniel in essence was doing, he was, he was altering the curriculum in a Yahwehist direction. Then when Nebuchadnezzar died, and his son, Evil Marduk, took it, took the kingship. And then he was, remember, he was assassinated in a military coup. And then there was another guy, and then he was assassinated, et cetera, et cetera. The man who took the throne eventually, Nabonidus, was the son of a priestess of the moon god. And he made it his job to de Yahwehize Babylonian culture. And so they had completed the process, and they decided to throw a big banquet to celebrate the completion of the de of Babylon. And so to prove that God was a wimp, they took the goblets from the temple that they had stolen and they were gonna to drink toast to their gods. And you know what happened, right? There was some graffiti that showed up. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> and, and uh, this Belshazzar, Belteshazzar, again, remember, he was the son of Nabonidus. Nabonidus was down south trying to recuperate. He had some lung ailment or something. And uh, it says, you know, he saw that thing and I love, love the way the Hebrew kind of says that his, his loins gave way or something to that effect. Uh, <laughs> if we were British, we'd say, he soiled his trousers. <laughs> but anyway, you know, 
Well, there was a lot of contempt for God where all the people were scattered, you know. So, yeah, well, that, 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 that project didn't work too well, did it? And then Cyrus came along and, and sponsored the rebuilding of the temple using Babylonian money. That's, you know, I love the Bible, how, how, it, how, it, how it narrates things. But imagine the kind, of, the, the kind of intimidation that these guys faced. It must have been very important to God that his people learn to imitate him and to obey him. Why? Why? Why was it so important? I'll tell you why. Because they were called by his name. What's in a name? It was so important for God to discipline Israel that he even allowed his holy name to be profaned among the nations. What's in a name? Remember, God called his people by his name. The name Israel means, roughly, he who prevails with God and man. Remember that name came out of that little wrestling match that uh, Jacob had. The name Judah means, praise the Lord. In the Old Testament, a person's name was the same as the person himself. And when Israel rebelled against God, they profaned God's person by their behavior. And the nations where they were scattered profaned God's person by their ridicule. Oh yeah, these are God's people, ha ha ha. Now, let me go to the second question that we asked at the beginning in conclusion here. The second question was, why was God so determined to restore his people to the land that he had promised them? I'll tell you why. Because they were called by his name. And God would not let his name be profane forever. You know, when you get in trouble and God disciplines you, you can rest assured that he will restore you, not for your sake, but for his name's sake. God would restore his people, not for their sakes, but for his name's sake. And in restoring the people, his people, God would demonstrate to the nations that he was the only true God and that he is the God who deals with his people on the basis of pure grace. I don't know if you notice, if you ever read any manuscripts of other religions and stuff, and they talk about their leaders or whatever, it's always in idealistic terms. Oh, he did this and he did that, and everything was hunky-dory and never did anything wrong. You look at the Bible, <laughs> you know, you realize these guys and these women were jacked up. Like, like us, you know, I mean, uh, Samson, you know, what a piece of work, right? <laughs> Urban uh, vandalism, rural vandalism, running after crazy women, I mean, you know, and, and yet and still God used him. Here is Jephthah, a gangbanger, you know. And uh, well, that's, the, you know, isn't that, isn't that what it was? But God used them in a mighty way. All these people had hang ups. God's not worried because they were called by his name, and he will vindicate his name. The restoration of God's people would be complete, it says here. They would return from the nations, they will be cleansed from their sins. They will be empowered by the Holy Spirit and they would enjoy endless grace. But if we look closely at this passage, we realize that this restoration was much more than what happened at the end of the exilic period under Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah. God was also speaking about the ultimate restoration under the Messiah. And this includes us. Christ was an Israelite, the seed of Abraham. And in Christ, we inherit all the promises to Abraham and his seed. 
meaning Christ, right? And therefore, in Christ, we have the benefits of being called Yisrael and Judah. We also have the privilege of being called by Christ's name. And that's why we are the body of Christ. What's in a name? I'll tell you what's in God's name, what's in Christ's name, God's infinite grace. Sadly, God's name is still being profaned among the nations of our day by our neglect of the A and B sides of covenant faithfulness, by the ridicule that others, of others, as they see our declining in integrity and influence. God promises to restore us by what? By vindicating his name by which we are called. And therefore, you know, sometimes we get out there, you, some of y'all are going to get out there, you're going to have congregations that have certain ideas and stuff, and oh, I cannot speak about that, or I cannot act upon that because they might have a church meeting and, kick, and declare the pulpit vacant. Well, to that I say, ha. <laughs> Why? Because we have nothing to fear in standing up for righteousness and justice because we are called by God's name and God will not allow his name to be profaned forever. He will take care of us. He will look after us. Our future is in his hands. Why? Because we are called by his name. And we are free to answer God's call to full faithfulness, A side and B side. Familiar Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You see that? What's going on here? He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. That's why you get those privileges. You don't have to worry about people. What's in God's name? Well, let us never take it for granted. Let us always treasure it for grace. And let us always wear it in gratitude. And let us express our gratitude by doing what he commands us to do. The heck with the circumstances. If we appreciate being called by God's name, then we will see th through the worst circumstances that can afflict us for being faithful. I'm telling you something, the world does not like Jesus. And the more you try to do right, the more you're gonna get pushed back. Well, that's to be expected, isn't it? Hmm. But if we embrace full faithfulness, A and B side, oh, there's gonna be some people upset. but they're just people. They're not God. I, I think about, and some of you, if you stand up and do the right thing, yeah, you might, you might suffer something. But I think about my friend Habakkuk. And in his whole book, he's struggling with the, with the, with the, with the issue of unanswered prayers. Oh God, how long? Why? How long? Why? How long? Why? And then he realizes, wait a minute. God's in control of this. He, he got me. He got my back. And so he concludes, he says this. He said, though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, 
Though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, goodness, this is a bad situation, isn't it? But what does he say? He says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. You see, Habakkuk knew that he was called by God's name. And then he goes on, the sovereign Lord is my strength. You see that? He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go to the heights. Saints, why don't we just dare to act on the fact that God's got our back because we are called by his name. What's in a name? Hmm. Interesting question. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your word, how profound it is, how you protect us, how you take care of us, even in the worst situations. Teach us to know that when everything possible can go wrong, that you are still faithful. Help us to understand that we only see the debit side of the ledger sheet, but you see both the debit and the credit side. And if we could see it from your point of view, we would rejoice. Thank you for showing us little glimpses of that. When things in history would happen, we say, oh, I, I can never recover from this. And then years later, you look back at it, we look back at it and laugh and say, oh, yeah, that's the best thing that could have happened. Help us to understand, Lord, that we have the freedom to obey you. Forgive us, Lord, for taking your, great, your, your, your name for, for granted and give us the grace to respond according to your word, not according to our fears and hang-ups. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.